those little virulent little parasites, they're like homeless vagrants. They would love to find a nice warm home and make it all cozy for themselves. So they slow us down, they lower our body temps, they make us really agitated so we only want to eat sugar all day, you know. Starbucks, venti, mocha, you know, five pumps of high fructose corn syrup. They love that. You're listening to the Holistic Nootropics Podcast, your home for holistic, evidence-based cognitive enhancement strategies. And now your host, Eric Levi. Dr. Grace, thank you so much for joining me today on the Holistic Nootropics Podcast. I'm so happy to be here. Totally stoked. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is going to be great. Um, so I want to I want to kick things off on this podcast because I was, you know, kind of reading through your through your blog and through your website and you work with MMA fighters doing gut health. And yes. that really piques my interest. I mean, I love MMA. Um, I'm a dude. I love, you know, I like to bro out a little bit, you know. Um, but what I'm more interested in is our the, the idea that you work with MMA fighters and extreme sports athletes with their gut health. How does that work? You know, gut health is just a super hidden superpower that people don't tap into, as you know. And uh, when it's broken, uh, that's when things are pretty effed up, right? They, they may have um, brain fog, body fat, or fatigue issues. MMA fighters, as you know, have to cut before a lot of fights, you know, 20, 35 pounds sometimes. And there can be challenges each time they do that. They're kind of doing a yo-yo diet kind of phenomenon thing. And they can get harder and harder as their career goes on. But they don't realize that some of the uh, very diets they're on, low, low fiber, low prebiotic diets, can, can actually damage their gut permanently. Or if they've been on antibiotics, a lot of them train in Thailand, then they get a parasite and they take tons of you know, medications or antibiotics, they're further damaging their gut microbiome. And then it gets even harder to cut. And even worse, some may start noticing you know, lower anabolic hormones over time. And they don't know why. They're doing the same old thing, you know, great workouts or even better workouts, more camps, even better camps, working with better coaches, whatever, right? Um, or they're taking even better supplements, as you know. There's a great you know, list of supplements that people can take. But they keep seeing their anabolic hormones keep dropping. Or they may you know, um, have you know, great, you know, great diets, great workouts. Everything's awesome, but things just aren't hitting where they are for peak performance. And this you know, performance is everything in any kind of sport. We also work with Spartan racers, Spartan champions, Ironmen, Ironwomen, uh, triathletes. Time on the podium, you know, where you rank in podium means a lot, not just prestige, but it can mean contracts, right? Sponsorships, money, and um, entry, you know, into larger arenas. So uh, people don't realize that the gut microbiome can be this superpower that is an ally that help people to get uh, better performance, sharper, quicker reflexes, and more power. But if it's not ideal and um, full of let's say, friendly bacteria, our allies, our gut guardians, if they're full of pathogens and parasites, the problem is they start stealing energy, they start stealing steroids is what I call it, and they start stealing the anabolic hormones. So we work with clients, um, executives, like really bright multitasking moms, and all kinds of elite athletes uh, to reduce body fat, brain fog, and fatigue. And often what we'll see in just like two months or less, we will increase anabolic hormones by 50% very naturally, or even 3x, depending on how low you know, they start off with, with us. So it's all based on science, what we do. Um, there's a researcher in Australia. His name is Tremelin. He's really amazing. Um, he um, also is a, a professor at the Adelaide School of Pharmacy. And he did this little study. It was really amazing. He took um, a bunch of Berlin boys, men, you know, I think they were age 18 to 40, gave them a dose of gram-negative pathogenic cell wall. So gram-negatives, uh, they can be good guys, and then some are not so great. They're virulent and pathogenic. He took the cell wall of them. It's called the lipopolysaccharide LPS. Gave them a, just a low dose, like 0.8 nanograms per kilo. And what he saw was that within just six hours, their testosterone really dropped. And then these are healthy guys. Their BMI was like barely 23, really healthy, lean guys. And then within a few hours, you know, they all improved. What happens over time is when people have had a lot of antibiotics, whether it's for strep throat or parasites or, you know, any kind of fever, cold, you know, situation that is really more viral, it's not really bacterial, you know, people getting all these useless antibiotics, sometimes they're needed. You know, I had a C-section surgery. My daughter would have died if I had, didn't have it. You know, I'm really grateful for that. But I got an IV antibiotic during that. And, that. and what happens is depending on the route of antibiotic and what it is and the spectrum of it, and whether it's IV versus by mouth oral, you're gonna, we, we, we're, we can be eradicating the microbiome. And our microbiome, what it is, is it's um, 
a tr you know, there, it's a hundred trillion of our bacteria and microbes, and they line our, our, our whole body, tongue to toes or for men, tongue to testicles. And when they're damaged or missing, and we don't resurrect them properly, then they can't help us through life. They are literally the fountain of youth. And when they're damaged, it's like a sprained ankle. You know, you may not see it, but it will be in pain and then things will be out of alignment. So a lot of mental health issues come out of that as well, not just poor performance and low testosterone or low anabolic hormones. I feel like I'm in my 30s and I'm still recovering from antibiotic use in my, I mean, early teens. I used to see a doctor. My mom would take me to doctor. I don't want to say his name, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, she would take me to this doctor and I was just getting sore throats like crazy, you know, from the time I was probably 13 to 17. It just felt like every couple months, just, just strep throat or it got diagnosed as strep throat. Who knows what it was? Um, yeah. but the doctor's solution was antibiotic, antibiotic, amoxicillin. I, I had so much amoxicillin and I mean, back then this is the nineties. Like who knew? Nobody talked, nobody knew. No the microbiome. Knew. Right. He we was had no doing, idea. you know, the best medicine back then. It's right. Like I don't, right. exactly. I don't blame the guy. Right. Right. But, but now you know, we know a little bit better. Yeah. And now that I know that I had no idea, I was, it was just a nuclear bomb, just firebombing my microbiome and all of my beneficial gut bacteria. Right. Exactly. And, and it's like, I have these conditions, just these like little nagging things that pop up from time to time. And I, mm. I, I just feel like this is still, t even though I've healed my gut, I still feel like this is tied to, you know, 20, 25 years ago when I was, when I was going down this rat. Right. Yeah, and it's all, it's all reversible. We're fortunate now, you know, I'm so grateful that we have all these tools, you know, at our fingertips, like really high potency probiotics. We've got gut protocols that gently weed. So our protocols are to weed, seed, and feed. You know, once we overgrow some of the bad things, you know, because of the lack of the gut guardians, we want to weed them down a little bit, right? That opens up these little ecological niches so that we can seed, you know, it's like a lawn, we can put in the good flora back in, but there's nowhere for them to go. It's kind of like musical chairs, you know. We have to open up an empty seat so they can actually have a place to sit down and stay. And then we want to anchor them there by feeding them the appropriate prebiotics. Only human prebiotics, not, you know, rodent prebiotics. The, the lipopolysaccharide thing is really interesting, too, because, I mean, that's, that's leaky gut, right? Like when you have leaky yes. gut, that you're going to have mm -hmm. a high amount of uh, lipopolysaccharide. And exactly. I would imagine in athletes that's quite high because you're you're living in a high stress situation right, all the right. time. You're not digesting exactly. and you're getting yes. You're getting there's a lot of studies on athletes. We're I mean so fortunate all these microbiome studies have come out on athletes. You know, when they engage in endurance sports or engage uh, in endurance uh, training, you know, condition and strength and training, um, it's 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 really stressful. And they, they're more prone to infections, upper respiratory infections, gut infections, all kinds of infections. If they're in a foreign country, you know, they're going to have more parasites and things like that. And uh, studies also show that under, you know, extreme conditions, extreme sports and endurance sports, they can undergo small intestinal embolic events. That's like a heart attack for the small intestines. They can have obstruction, you know, as you know, a lot of athletes, you know, if they're get nervous or even regular executives or urban athletes, you know, they get, if they get too stressed, they have diarrhea, you know, while they're running. I've, I've heard of <laughs> many stories, you know, they get, people totally can't run on the day they're supposed to, you know, have their race, um, marathon or triathlon or whatever, because their, their gut is so impaired, you know, and they're having basically irritable bowel syndrome. Yeah, it's because of a poor microbiome. So what we do is we're kind of like the, the wealth portfolio, but for the gut. You know, we want to bring in the wealth, lower liabilities, whether it's bankruptcy, you know, or, you know, non-dividend performing stocks, right? We want to diversify, right? Get in real estate, get in bonds, get in cash, get in all of it, you know, stocks, the right stocks. Does that make That's sense? Great. So we can look at, yeah, we have testing for everything. We don't want to guess. We don't want to fuck around. Yeah. I mean, it's complex. You can't just look at somebody and go, here's your gut protocol. And it's the same one I gave to everybody because everyone's starting from no. a different place. But yeah. what I understand is that an optimal microbiome is exactly kind of like what you're talking about. The, the, the more diverse, the more, um, I've yes. heard like you want to feed your gut or you want to eat, I don't know, like a hundred different kinds of food or something every week or, or, or some, some number like that or 200 because all these different foods, you know, and, and we're talking healthy foods, um, you know, it's going to, it's going to essentially seed a different 
strain yeah. or, or microbe in the gut? Well, it's really different. I mean, uh, every, every case is really different for us. But yeah, once we get the human, you know, core keystone species there, then you can, you know, have a, a, a liberalized diet. You know, a lot of our clients, they can't eat gluten when they first come to us. Some are even restricted to like four foods on earth. That's it. And they get more and more food allergies, you know, as they proceed, as they cut more and more food out. But usually in just two months or less, our clients are liberalizing. Even by four or five, six months, we want people to try a little gluten and just see what the reaction is. And usually they're fine. You know? Some wow. will be so impaired, you know, they're in bed for six months if they eat a little drop of gluten when they first initially come to us. They're so gluten intolerant. But even our friends who are like celiac or our clients who are celiac, they, when they go to Europe, sometimes it's no problem eating the, Euro, uh, the European uh, gluten. Beer. That's in, that's really interesting, and I've I've so I kind of go back and forth on this kind of European, um, you know, American bread situation. I was talking to somebody about the French paradox, and you know, I from what I understand, I've heard it. The French paradox. It's like this idea that well, how come the French people don't have as many gluten allergies and they don't get fat like you know Americans do? And you know, people say, well their bread doesn't have as much gluten and they, cause they eat a lot of bread. They eat like when I went to France, when I went to Paris, I was just eating baguettes like crazy. And you know, they're like, they eat a lot of bread. How come they don't yeah. have the problems that Americans do? And so I've heard it's the gluten thing, but then I heard this person speak, uh, or I've read, I read this paper called, um, Oh, uh, is it iron? I, I think it's called iron misbehaving badly or something like that. And basically the idea is that, our bread in America is fortified with, uh, with iron. And, um, and it's not like, I, like iron you get from red meat is different from iron they fortify bread with. And sure. so the, the bread that gets the, fort, the, the iron fortification, it's like literally iron shavings. So a lot of times uh -huh. people believe that, okay, it's the gluten. And I'm, I'm all on board because I've read a lot about the, the harms of gluten too. But I wonder if there's any truth to this thing. Like, could it also be these other things in the bread, like the Absolutely. iron fortification, yeah. no, the, the chemicals, yeah. the bleach? Yeah, there's a lot of, yeah, adjuvants that they add or flowing ingredients to make the flour flow. I used to have it. I have a degree in food science. So, yeah. And then uh, uh, most wheat and also even our non-gluten sources, like non-organic oats, a um, lot of uh, pulses and, uh, you know, uh, you know, our, our storage of different st starches, you know, they're covered in glyphosate because mm -hmm. glyphosate is an herbicide, which is also anti pest and anti, you know, weevil as well as anti even, um, you know, other pathogens. So, um, but it kills all the good stuff as well too, at least the dysbiosis and all the clinical studies. So yeah, we're, we're kind of fucking ourselves with all kinds of processed foods, unfortunately. Eating most na as, as natural and organic and from the earth, farm to table is like really more helpful. Yeah. yeah. And, helpful. yeah. and it's like, it's crazy because it's like when you talk about the toxicity in food, you're really talking about these chemicals like glyphosate, um, you know, gluten, I mean, GMOs, whatever it is, uh, right. the flow agents, the bleach. That stuff, yeah. that stuff just wrecks your brain too, right? It will. I mean, it goes from yes, your gut yes, to your brain yes, and then it's like... There's a lot of like crap nootropic products out there where people aren't getting to the root issue of really what's going on. Why can't they focus? I mean, naturally, we should all have as much focus as we want, right? Clarity and fast, fast working neurons. Um, what I see is, you know, a lot of our clients do come to us with brain fog. They may be, you know, super high powered executives or like sharp MMA fighters um, or moms, you know, running their home as well as having a full career. Um, and when I look at the gut microbiome, we pull something called a urinogenic acid test. This is how we best look at microbiome going on. It's a metabolomic test. So we're, so we're looking at metabolites. You know, these are urine captured uh, uh, garbage that comes out of the, the microbiome, basically. It's much more accurate than a stool kit. The stool kit only captures the last 1.5 meters of the gut. So we want to see everything upstream and what's going on. So when we pull it, um, we'll see a lot of things that are suboptimal. We have actually kind of a lower threshold, a functional threshold compared to the comp parent company that we use. It's called Great Plains Labs, GPL, Great Plains Labs. And we have a kind of lower threshold because as people get healthier and they have clarity, focus, and the you know, fast neuron function that they want, um, we see these markers all go to the far, far, far left. So even when they're mildly suboptimal, you know, we're kind of concerned about that because it'll lead to this, the garbage that comes out of our, our 100 trillion, you know, bacteria and microbes can literally be like the rust that's going to make the engine 
you know, stick mm-hmm. and not work so smoothly and fast and spin, you know, at a, at a quick, even rate. And it's so easy to actually change all these values um, over time. Uh, you know, uh, you live in Puerto Rico, right? Um, it's moist, you know, just like the East Coast. And there can be things that we see geographically, you know, as well. Uh, uh, when there's more mold on this organic acid test, we'll see more mold as well, too. Mold is a big contributor to brain fog. It can be just a little bit. Does it mean you have to eat only bulletproof coffee and eat only mold-free peanuts forever? No. Like, your body should be able to break down mold, the small amounts that we get through daily living. Our probiotic, it's called Bifida Maximus, we actually have many strains in there that break down mold. And plus, the cell wall of our good bacteria, not, not pathogens, cell wall of our good bacteria are literally like ionic resins. They bind all kinds of toxins, heavy metals, mycotoxins, glyphosate, all of them, and then pull them out of the system as we defecate them out. Presuming people defecate. People don't know. They should right. have to be defecating like twice a day with a Bristol 4. Bristol 4 just means, oh, they're really pretty poops. They don't float. They're not greasy. You know, they don't mark the sides of the bowl. They make a nice little serpent at the bottom of the bowl. Right? Yeah. And some people can't achieve that. Some only poop twice a week. I'm like, oh, my fucking goodness. I don't know how you live. You're like 20 years away from cancer or two years, right? Um, some are having diarrhea all freaking day long. I'm like, wow. Like, that is not normal. Yeah. yeah. So we, heal, we try to heal all that within two weeks or less. Those are great metrics. And they match really well with brain function, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah I, we look I mean, a lot of other metrics too, like temperature. Like some of our clients come to us, people have temperatures of a lizard. Well, you cannot combat the little parasites and pathogens that end up clogging our brains, you know, at a temperature of 96, 95, 97. We're mammalian. Our main evolutionary advantage, if you believe in evolution, is that we develop a mammalian temperature so that we can fry the viruses, fungi, you know, and other parasites that end up, you know, trying to invade and maraud, be marauders, you know, in our body. Yeah, that's, oh, that's so interesting. Two weeks. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's really impressive because, I mean, this is an issue that, I mean, could take people years if they if they don't just give up altogether i mean I, I know people who have been like you said diarrhea all day every day i lived in new york for eight years and that's like the that's what it is new it's york, just people who come walking around shitting themselves because there's no <laughs> there's no public bathrooms and there's so much pizza and bagels um <laughs> pizzas and bagels <laughs> yeah but i mean it's like the people don't understand that it's like you you can't do anything if you don't start with can you poop at least once a day. <laughs> and like you said, a Bristol four, like a nice snaky, long, solid sinks, doesn't float. Um, it's a, that's such a challenge. And then, you know, what gets me is, okay, they can't poop. Doesn't mean they're not trying to get healthy. In fact, I see a lot of people who are like on these low fat diets and they're doing the keto and all this stuff. Oh my God, I got some, I got some exogenous ketones and I'm, you know, I'm doing a detox. And then, you know, the first, one of the first people I ever worked with this girl, she, she, um, she is in and out of doing these detoxes. And she's like, every time I do a detox, I feel worse. And come to find out she don't poop like more than once or twice a week. <laughs> It's like, of course, how can you detox when you can't do the D part? You know, yeah, you, can't get, you can't get it out of you. It's you're just retoxing is what you're doing. Yeah. And those little virulent little parasites, like they love to, you know, take up like the vacant space in our bodies, right? Like, you know, they're, they're like homeless vagrants. They would love to find a nice warm home and make it all cozy for themselves. So they slow us down. They lower our body temps. They make us really agitated, so we only want to eat sugar all day. You know, sugar, woo! It, they love sugar. Yeah. Our good flora don't eat sugar. They mucusy, you know, starchy tubers, cook, cook tubers, and you know, they love like asparagus, veggies, and you know, meat. Um, but you know, the virulent pathogenic flora, they love all the simple stuff: the simple carbs, the sugars. You know, Starbucks, venti, mocha. You know, five pumps of high fructose corn syrup. They love that shit. Yeah. You know, it was, for me, it was when I did my first like real gut, like this was like five years ago and, and I only did it cause my wife, you know, she's like, I got this thing. It's the microbiome. We're going to do a detail. I'm like, what the hell is the microbiome? And I was like, <laughs> she's like, you need to do it with me. I'm like, I don't want to do it. That sounds stupid. And she's like, if you don't do it, I'm just going to rub it in your face. I'll get it is. And it's like, when you in that sort of situation, you know, it was like a hostage situation. I'm like, fine, I'll do the hostage microbiome thing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I did it and you know, it was 
bonkers because one of the first things I noticed was that my sugar cravings gone. And, yes. and that was a thing that the, it was from a naturopath. They were talking about like the microbiome, you know, like this candida stuff and the fungus. Exactly. And the, it, it, it's like, it's what controls your brain. It's like you have a, like an alien in you and it's like sugar, yeah. sugar. And oh yeah. N- yeah. So now it's like, I, I don't, you know, I don't drink soda, you know, eat candy and yeah. that stuff. Um, but yeah. that was like one of the biggest things that happened. Yeah. What we hear from clients is, you know, their acne goes away, yep. their eczema psoriasis goes away. One of our clients, um, she'd gone to Mexico and came back with something and we immediately, you know, we always go big to small. We work on parasites first and then fungal next and bacteria went the smallest and we work on bacteria and then viruses are last. So we started the parasite. She had long standing um, depression. Within uh, two months of doing the parasite protocol, she was off her antidepressants. She um, was seeing me in her car again within two to four weeks. That was the first time she ever had done that in decades. Um, people don't realize like once, you know, we get little, little non-friendlies in our little gut, you know, uh, and they take over, like they hijack the brain. They really do. And it's all for their good. Um, not really for us. I had a parasite called Morganella and a uh, study showed that it actually secretes serotonin. Mm. Many of these little, little friendlies secrete a lot of different kind of amines and little, you know, chemical uh, signals, um, but it's all for their gain. You know, some are histamines, some are other amines, some are even neuro, you know, neurotransmitters, some are even um, adrenaline, you know. So they really hijack us and make us agitated so we can't calm down, can't focus, have clarity, right? And you make terrible financial decisions or terrible, you know, people make terrible partnering or, you know, dating decisions, you know, whatever. Uh, because, uh, yeah, because they're just, you know, all a muck. Their hard drive is a muck. Well, my, my parasite, Morganella, makes serotonin. So every time I ate sugar and fed it, I felt happy. I literally, like, turned on my serotonin. But then it would crash, right? And then you'd want it again, and it would make the Morganella really happy, right? And the second I did my protocols, you know, I not only lost 10 pounds within a week or two, but I no longer had sugar cravings either. That's what it is, right? It's like you're sitting there and this, this, this little parasite's like, you know what you know would be great today? Sugar. Don't you want some sugar? <laughs> don't, you want a, don't you want some ice cream? Don't you want some soda? You're like, I kind of want some ice cream or soda today. Yeah, and, and, then, and, then, and then it's like Coke and then it's gambling and then it's Right. Like Hookers and blow and <laughs> – yeah, and by the way, you're going to Vegas after this, so sounds like you're <laughs> sounds like well, you this parasite might be. <laughs> no, I just wanted to go to a restaurant. <laughs> I don't blame it's you. Essential, essential. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That the, the the parasite thing to me is so interesting because um, I don't. It's it's like this invisible force in you that I, I mean I don't know what the prevalence of parasites are in people, but you know the more I learn about something like. Um, I mean, like gut bacteria and, and candida and things, the more I think like, I would imagine a majority of people are probably dealing with a parasite of some sort, you know, when I look at, when you look at the amount of sugar people eat in this country, right? You just have to look yes. at the sales of, exactly. of sugar. Yes. And so it's like, well, that right. didn't just miraculously right. happen, you know, it's like, right. and, and so where does that come from? Like, where, because not everybody's so, traveling. So I've, yeah, there's some really amazing microbiome and population studies, hunter gatherers, even healthy, you know, disease free octogenarians so over 80 you know over 90 they have parasites but what they also do do you study the blue zones or did you see jason prowl's um longevity film i'm familiar with the blue zones yeah. yes yeah so you know um there's lots of microbiome studies on this like particular subset of humans um there is uh, uh they have very high longevity they're disease-free cancer-free um and they're no centenarians they live over 100 and th- what they have is um, no health care. So they have very little antibiotics, right, as you can imagine. And they're usually pretty lean, you know, and they have, you know, great community. They're always, you know, hugging and have an extended family near them. They also eat a very, very, very uh, complex uh, five carbohydrate diet. And they all are carnivores, like none, none are be- uh, vegetarian, you know, generally speaking, like none. Um, but they eat a lot of vegetables, a lot of prebiotics, but they also eat tongue to toe, you know, tongue to tail, hoof, hoof to hoof to tail. And um, when they studied microbiome, um, they have all the complement of really healthy keystone bacteria. They have strains known as acromantia, 
I call them the ABC. So A is for Akkermansia, B is for bifidal longum. So longum is for longevity. It was discovered and named in uh, Japan, and they're always found in high amounts, abundant amounts in people who are healthy, they don't have IBS, they don't have cancer, you know, and in centenarians. So we have a probiotic that uh, has it. It's also shown in human trials and animal trials to be really great. It lowers um, agitation, anxiety, improves mood, reduces depression, and, um, you know, helps all the pathways, BDNF and serotonin as well, too, bifidobacteria long. Uh, the C is Clostridiolus and Christian Sinella. They're associated with leanness and reduced diabetes, reduced body fat. Um, they're found in uh, people with high, high health. So these ABCs are um, often missing, you know, in this portfolio that's in people's guts. And then they become, can have more vulnerability to any kind of microbe uh, infestation. So it could be parasite, it could be viral, it could be candida, it could be anything, strep. When we're missing those, you know, these are the really hardcore guardians, you know, then, then it's like, oh, okay, and then all the gangsters take over. There's always going to be some, you know, it's not, not a problem. So hunter-gatherers and even, you know, older, healthy, elderly still have parasites. Those aren't the problem. It's only that they become in massive quantity. And then we want to help lower the load a bit and bring in. The key is still to have like 80-20, 80% really good stuff. It's how do, we, how do we get those in there and feed them and sustain them? Right. Cause it's like, cause it's about that symbiotic relationship. It's about the, it's about the good guys and the bad guys living together and not trying yeah. to just nuclear bomb and like, you know, yes. get all the yes. bad guys out. Cause it's like, yeah. they gotta, the bad guys almost keep the good guys stronger. Right. Probably. Yeah. 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 Even candida. I mean, it's not super bad. We need it to chelate heavy metals. We need it to help make B vitamins and absorb B vitamins. But when it goes out into like excess value, you know, it's too high and it's no longer producing dividends, then we kind of want to like squash a bit. Candida can get really super nasty and virulent. It can hold viruses within it. Uh, we can never eradicate H. pylori, a bacterium associated with gastric cancer and heartburn and GERD, because it lives inside candida. H. pylori literally lives inside candida. So it's really hard to eradicate a bacteria unless you have an antifungal at the same time. So what we utilize is a lot of botanical protocols. And we uh, mix protocols. So we're, you know, mildly antifungal, mildly antibacterial concurrently. And so we go big to small because microbes like to live within larger microbes. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. It's a microbe-eat-microbe -microbe world. And that's the ecosystem. And that's how these species interact with one another. And we have to keep that into consideration. We can't wipe them all out and not be able to integrate the, the guardians that we really... The, the whole goal of what we do is resurrect immunity. We need to resurrect like between 300 to 500 species in the gut, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. The, the candida conversation to me is, is so interesting. And I've, I've recently changed my view of candida because, you know, I was, yeah. I mean, you, you learn things as you go along and it's like all you hear about if you're, if you even dabble in the little mommy blog world, it's like candida, oh. here's my candida protocol. We got to eradicate candida. But it's like you said, candida has a biological purpose, which is to, uh, you said chelate heavy metals, um, chelate yes. heavy metals, which is what and I understand as well. Us B, offer us B vitamins or help integrate them. Yeah. Right. Of course. And it's, and the problem is, is when it gets out of control, I've recently um, heard that candida has a specific function when it comes to oxalate. So, um, so, so I forget exactly what it is, but are, are you, cause I know you run the organic acids test. So, so you're yes, probably so familiar with oxalates oxalate. on there. Yeah. 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 The markers 19, 20 and 21. Yes. Yeah. So, so mold how do you. also makes oxalates too. Mold does make oxalate. Right. Yeah. Because right. That makes yeah. sense. Um, so that whole microbiome, the, the fungal world, um, especially the virulent ones make a lot of oxalates. The, the so just to let your audience know, oxalates, um, they pair with calcium and then they crystallize and mm -hmm. they can go to the bone. The biggest repository is our skeletal system, the bone. So when we see, you know, bone problems, osteopenia, osteoporosis, you know, phosphoric acid not being metabolized appropriately, um, there's uh, usually, it's because someone has a lot of fungal overgrowths. Yeah. Uh, but the other second big repository for oxalates you know, where they love to go. It's like a mineral, you know, um, it's our mucosa. 
and our endothelium. So when we see high blood pressure, you know, heart attacks, that's actually calcification from oxalates. The extreme end is kidney stones, but in between that, you know, it's our soft tissue and our mucosal lining. So gut, all gut issues are like oxalate, in my opinion, you know, um, but we just don't make, we don't directly address it always. Um, it's also bladder, you know, and vaginal lining for men prostate. So elevated prostate or benign prostate hypertrophy, you know, men trickling and can't fully void as they get older. It's, it's, it's also uh, fungal and mold and the lack of our good guardians, that 80, 20, not enough of our 80% good guardians to keep oxalates down. So for instance, I have a probiotic I formulated just so we could break down oxalates with it. Five species break down oxalates. There's many bifida, many uh, uh, lactobacilli strains, like ferment, found in fermented foods, let's say. They, they break down oxalates. Wow. Yeah. And then there's a the big strain called Oxalobacter formigenes. It doesn't come as a probiotic right now. But if you're out in nature, you're going to get some. Um, but antibiotics will, um, of course, make people lose that Oxalobacter formigenes. With our good bifido, bifilongum, that's a, one of our major oxalate degraders, it has many enzymes to help break down oxalates. We will lose it after a couple courses of antibiotics. Or if you have a vulnerable gut, maybe mom didn't hand down a great gut to you, gut microbiome, you probably may not have had it at birth. And then you know, you're more prone to these calcification or calcium oxalate issues. Yeah, that, that's a, um, you actually just hit on a thing that, that I, I've heard and I just kind of forgot about, but you just reminded me, which is the idea that the reason oxalates are such a problem right now is because we, you should have a, uh, a, a probiotic or a, um, a microbe in your gut, oxalobacter. Yeah. You should have many, yeah, um, that breaks down oxalate and so many of us are missing them. And, yes, yes. And, and I think what happens is, and this is what happens in my case, because I've tested high for high oxalate, um, is that as soon as you jump on the health food train, all the health foods are high in oxalate. So, you know, you start- Our healthiest foods, the foods that centenarians eat are full of oxalates. Yeah, spinach, nuts, uh, you know, beet yeah. greens and beets and all these things. It's like, it's like oh, well, you know, I, I start my day every day with a green smoothie and a large dose of oxalate. And yeah. you don't realize you're like, oh my God, I feel I'm so healthy, but how come I got all these skin issues? How come it's like this arthritis yeah. is like, I got these cracky right. knees and things. And it's like, exactly. it's, it's so yeah. prevalent in the health community. Um, oh, and yeah. it, it's oh, like yeah. the, it's like the elephant in the room. Nobody wants to talk about like, right, right, right. okay. And then, you, and then you add in there another mineral. Um, you know, you sound like a warrior, Eric. You know, a lot of our clients are these, you know, warrior moms, it. War, war, yeah, warrior athletes, right? Warrior executives. They all have iron overload. They're all doping, but naturally with iron, which increases oxygenation. So even if you have your arm chopped off or you've got 10 knife wounds, you're going to eh, keep going. So they have iron overload. So you got iron and calcium oxalates. That's like crystallized joints, crystallized prostates, crystallized ovaries for women, infertility, low testosterone. Right, migraines, headaches, mood issues, bipolar, wow. yeah, uh, IBS, yeah, so, and then cancer, yeah, but we help reverse all that. We have to, you know, help consider the terrain of the whole body, tongue to tail, you know, gently, you know, gently get, you know, lower pathogens, and then uh, we're able to, you know, launch and get in the good flora, and then people feel awesome, and then they can anchor it uh, with the good gut flora. Like really good gut flora. What do you think about um, bone broth and its relationship to like gut healing? For healing, um, we're not the biggest fan. I mean, some broth is good. You know, natural broth is really good. Um, the problem is that bone broth has a lot of collagen in it, right? And naturally you would think that's, oh, that's really good for healing organs, blah, blah, blah. It's not. It's actually very high in arginine, you know, which will give boners to men. That's great. But the problem is when anything high in arginine, if it's not balanced with lysine, um, then that creates this issue where it, uh, anything high in arginine without matched lysine is going to lower lysine. The body can't work that way in terms of nutritional and food science. And so when we lower lysine, that's our main viral defense. So most people, when they're missing their complement of really good gut flora, like all the ABCs are gone, usually they also have a lot of viral activation. They're like a hot little mess, you know. And they've got Epstein-Barr, they've got herpes, and they've got CMV, Parvo, HHV6, whatever, you know. And they might have had shingles, you know, constant colds, whatever. 
um, you know, we, we don't, we don't want to further someone's viral defenses. We want to make it maximal as we can. So we uh, want to consider not too much collagen. I've heard of way too many stories where people get like <clears throat> a herpes outbreak or chicken pox, you know, reactivation after taking collagen supplements at very high dose. Yeah. yeah. I, I, and I've, I've, I've been very wary of collagen supplements. Um, Mo- they, most also are full of lead, you know, the chicken or yeah. the beef where it's from, you know, it's really close to freeways and not, not organic. Bone carries a lot of heavy metals from the environment Mm -hmm. and you're like, you know, really contract, you know, extracting that tightly. So it's hard to get a good source. So I just don't bother. I just, you know, eat more naturally. So is there a food then that, that pairs L-arginine or arginine and lysine together well? I um, don't know of too many that would be safe for our gut clients. Yeah. So we just, we just do lysine supplementation and minimize the collagen, you know, uh, Yeah. What builds good collagen for people and connective tissue and ligaments is actually good bacteria. Studies show they increase hyaluronic acid naturally. And there's even certain probiotics that just focus on that. But ours does as well too, Bifida Maximus. And that's why people who take it, not only do they feel pain-free, you know, less joint aches, um, they also look younger over time, like less wrinkles, you know, age spots, things like that. It's our good gut flora that really gives us that fountain of uh, longevity. Yeah. yeah. So like I was working with um, uh, a former UFC fighter, Kyle Kingsbury. I spoke at him about him once actually at Kale Effects. Um, he had started on this like wonky fad diet thing. Um, and suddenly he and his wife got super fat for no reason. Um, I was like, hey, okay, we'll help you fix that. He was on potato starch. You know, it's, raw starch is not eaten by humans. They're all toxic. They have anti-enzymes in there and all kinds of problems. Humans cook all the starch. So we eat starchy tubers, but they're all cooked. So anyway, we um, did some weeding and uh, he started to feel great. And then he added bionic fiber. It's just a concoction. Anybody can make it up. So we add, it's a mix of like psyllium and inulin, glucomannan, just fibers that people feel, you know, pretty good on. Uh, It's a mix and you could do pectin or modified citrus pectin. Now there's a lot of like FOS or XOS. There's like a lot of ways to really super amplify it for the brain or whatever function people want immunity. Um, So, and then he got on to like about 20, 25 grams of bionic fiber. And he told me like he and his wife did the uh, shake every day and the probiotics and they feel awesome. They stopped getting sick. They woke up every day with energy and he reduced his body fat, not doing anything. He had gotten fat. Well, for him, like it was like 13%. That's like nothing. And he went down to like seven, six or 7%, not, not changing anything in terms of diet or exercise, just only the weeding and the seeding feeding with the prebiotics and uh, probiotics. Wow. I'm a big fan of, of prebiotic uh, resistant starch in the form of green bananas so I'll throw, a, I'll throw a green banana in my smoothie in the morning. Do, do you do any, I mean, I know there's, there's products with resistant starch, but do you encourage any like resistant starch foods or foods that are high in resistant starch? The best resistant starch are the cooked ones. Okay. Yeah. And green banana does have like a lot of um, potential benefits because there are uh, a lot of pro-anthrocyanins and phytochemicals that are awesome, especially phytosteroids that are in green banana. But if you look traditionally with um, South American use, when it's used for diarrhea and other ailments, it's cooked. So it's what's not always, good? yeah, it's not, it's not eaten raw. And there's like, if you, if you taste it, there's tannins and oxalates in it. Like it like makes your uh, mother nature really protected a lot of um, vegetables. Like, so they don't get mowed down by herbivores with high, you know, concentrations, of anti-nutrients, <clears throat> anti-nutrients, you know, enzyme blockers, uh, things like that. Many, many raw starches of people or, or herbivores eat it for, you know, even beyond a week or two, they'll literally, you know, have their gut breakdown because it rips like the gut lining out and it can also affect their glands and cause cancers. So green banana, like I don't recommend a high amount of it anymore after I started to look at the studies where um, there's different kinds of resistant starches, right? So uh, the raw type, when they fed it to Saccharomyces, Candida, and other fungi, they grew really hard. It's a growth promoter for fungi. And then when I looked at how it affected uh, autoimmune triggers, like uh, uh, bacteria like Klebsiella, Citrobacter, and E. coli, it feed, raw starches feed those too. I mean, it's true. Cooked starches feed them as well too. 
But why take a really high, high, unnatural, unhuman, non-homo sapien dose of a raw resistant starch that no civilization eats raw, like green bananas? Mm-hmm. So I, I kind of look at an anthropological you know, way of looking things. I'm kind of Western A price tra- uh, trained. You know, I used to be chapter leader in my area. I think like looking ancestrally at things, there are medicine women and men and families. Like there's reasons why we've evolved the elaborate way we do what we do. So what are, so when you say cook starch, okay. Um, Another thing is before long um, and our keystone species, many, many of them, hardly any of them eat, ferment and break down or degrade the raw starches. There are a few that can, but, um, but our great majority eat, mucousy like you know uh gooey kind of type carbohydrates and polysaccharides and and i think that's why humans have evolved such a really different set of this this portfolio that feed our brain because somewhere along the line right humans evolved somewhere between paranthropus <laughs> this long ago um upright moving ape um, to homo, homo, our homo genus like Erectus and Florencensis and our uh, Neanderthal, you know, compatriots and, you know, finally Homo sapien, we have like way different brain and ours, our brains are 3x bigger than our ape, you know, analogs. And what's different is we have Bifolongum by 2 to 5x. And we have Christian Sinella and Acromancia and many of these other species that eat mucus. And somewhere between the mucus connection and the brain connection, I think that's where we have our happy zone, like for brain function. Interesting. So then, you know, when it, cause you've mentioned this a couple of times, the, the starch thing, and I, I've, what, what starch is good then um, cooked in, and what is a good uh, method for cooking these starches? Like, are you talking about potatoes? It doesn't matter. Anything, anything ancestrally prepared. So, okay. So this is something you may be missing, Eric. Um, when we have a really healthy gut, we emit so much gastric acid. That's our primary way of preventing infections, pneumonia, and even cancers, right? Because we unload so much acid into the stomach. And the stomach literally will have like half an inch to two centimeters of mucus to protect the lining so it doesn't just melt away, right, from all that acid. I used to work in a lab, and I had to make... Um, I had to make lab broth, you know, for all the uh, microbial cultures, the uh, post-grads and grad students working on. And I had to work with uh, pH 1, like, and pH 2 chemicals, acids. So I was like, you know, one normal acid, like, concentrations. And literally, I would go home, and I'd wash my clothes, and I'd have holes all over my cotton T-shirts. pH 1 or 2 is very, very, it's acidic. Like you'll blind yourself if you actually ever have it in your eye. You like will denature all your proteins everywhere and have scarring. Um, But that's what our gut releases. Our gut literally gets to pH two or even for some people lower, Um, but pH two or three is very normal. And um, so when we're eating cooked starches, we make it resistant the second it hits our stomach. If we have a healthy stomach. That's, oh my God, that's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's how we chemically modify things. Yeah. And there's like this whole thing too, where, um, you know, the, the, the balance of like, uh, like stomach acid and how things react in the stomach that that goes with it, where I've heard of like lemons, for instance. Right. Um, and this idea of like the alkaline diet, you know, and people are like, you gotta eat an alkaline diet. And, and they're like, well, you want to avoid acidic foods. Well, it's an acidic food lemon. Well, why do you avoid lemon? Because it's, because it's too acidic and it's like, but that's not how, that's not how no, the whole- it's shown, yeah, the PKA, the PK shows it actually will create a better alkaline environment, right? Right. That's the, it's the PKA that, that, that is that yeah. what it is that kind of, that kind of flips everything upside down where it's like, um, you know, you want, you want the acidity because the acidity essentially will, will make things more alkaline. Is that what you, yeah, that what you our, our gut is this great conduit, right? And it, it creates this like, uh, it, it's a juxtaposition. So our, the rest of our bodies and tissues can be alkaline, but the gut is super, uh, super high in protons, right? So we can have this acidic environment. Let's say your vagal nerve is fucked. Let's say you're stressed. Let's say your wife is screaming at you, right? Or you have little kids and you're screaming at them. <laughs> so like we, you know, like 
we get stressed, like people get stressed for no reason. Well, then you're instantly, you're not, you're not in rest and digest, you know, parasympathetic nervous system anymore. And your brain's like, Whoa! yeah. So there's a lot of reasons why we don't make acid in the stomach. Do we want to just take acid forever? You can as a supplement, but that is not a root issue that you're healing by doing that. You want to find the root issue. The root issue is that we don't have the good gut flora. They regulate acid secretion as well as motility, as well as the sphincters closing and opening, you know, and heartburn. Man, there's a, antibiotics and a war on stomach acid. That's like the mainstream yeah. medical system right there. You know, it's like the yeah, amount of people let's... taking PPIs and H2 blockers. And, and yeah. there was even uh, one uh, stomach acid blocker. It might have been an H2 blocker. I don't remember which one, but rancinidine or something. Uh, Renid rinididine? Renididine. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Zantac. Exactly. It got recalled uh, last year because they said it causes uh, cancer. So, um, well, any, and all these studies do show like, you know, within two to four months after someone's on Prilosec or other, uh, proton pump inhibitors, they're all very potent. Lansoprazole, Prevost said they develop candida overgrowth more in their, in their gut, more in candida overgrowth. Cause we need acid to, you know, have you ever cleaned your house with vinegar versus Clorox bleach? You know, I actually, I just recently started doing that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the the, the white vinegar. Yeah. Everything. Black. Yeah mold bacteria poop smells poop like because it it's like it's fucking it does everything it's anti-mold like if you ever have a moldy house just put place of vinegar everywhere you'll you'll be able to suppress this the spores it'll kill the spores wow yeah so we need a bit of acid every day or even you know i i recommend for some people for a really you know quick solution if they don't have side effects you know they can do like one or two teaspoons of apple cider vinegar into water with their meals until their gut gets better or lemon juice. That, that, those are all awesome. Or lime juice, not, not mojitos, Eric. Oh, uh, well it's, I don't know how I'm going to ever get on board with this protocol. Uh, <laughs> so that, so I guess I want to ask you one last thing and then, you know, because we are kind of running up on time, but um, you just brought up a thing that I, that I, I talk to clients about, which is, Fluid and food, right? So like the, the apple cider vinegar thing, the lemon water thing, I go back and forth with this. You know, the big thing I tell people is, you know, obviously I, chew your food a lot. You know, that's, yes. that's a big thing we don't do enough. Uh, but, then, uh, yes. but then you don't want to eat while you're drinking like fluid. Like you don't want to mix water or, or soda or coffee or beer or whatever with food because it dilutes the stomach acid. Is that true or is that a thing that you don't, you don't you know, I do. I've heard that a lot. Um, I don't know if I've seen any studies on that. I mean, I think chugging gallons at a meal probably is not ideal, but um, some, some fluid is probably fine. I think our body, as we, you know, hopefully people enjoy nice long meals, like for an hour, you know, or even longer. And that's plenty of time for a lot of water to get reabsorbed. I mean, you know, chyme, do you know what chyme is? It's like yep. our mixture of like stuff in the belly, right? As it moves through the bolus of food, you know, and, uh, you, you, I mean, you do need an adequate amount of uh, liquid to kind of get that going. I think traditionally in, the, in ancestral, you know, anywhere around the world that you go, there's often soup served, right? That's a liquid. Mm -hmm. You oppose that, but it's a warm liquid. It's nice to warm up the enzymes. Most of our enzymes have an optimal function uh, value to work at like our mammalian temperatures. So 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6, you know, Fahrenheit. Whenever we drop in our body temps or we drink a lot of cold water or eat cold things, then our, our enzymes may not work as optimally. And then, like, for instance, our stomach and uh, pancreatic digestive enzymes, they really do work best at the warmer temperatures to cleave and cut all our food down. But um, if it's something cold someone's eating or drinking, and then it's not going to be so ideal. Um, that's more my concern, the temperature. But the dilution factor, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure as long as it's not gallons of liquid, probably okay, you know. Best to have even like, if it's a one or two cups of really good, you know, vegetable soup or something, or beef stew. With something like um, bitters, you know, uh, a lot of people take bitters, uh, you know, 15 to 20 minutes or so before, you know, the, to, to fire up all of the digestive juices. Yeah, um, I love a product called Quicksilver. They have Bitters X. Yeah, it's liposomal and you can kind of like get into your system a bit faster. But yeah, bitters are awesome. It's very traditional too. We don't eat enough of the bitter vegetables either. Or because people have oxalate issues, they may not eat these bitter vegetables like yeah. mustard greens, yeah, and arugula. Actually, arugula is kind of lower oxalate, but I, yeah, all the peppery, bitter 
vegetables are pretty good for our gut. I know like it's a, it's a, kind of like talking about the Weston A. Price thing, traditional cultures. You know, I've heard that back in the day they used to, uh, they used to drink like ginger beers or, uh, or uh, bitter beers yeah, or before they would exactly. eat Exactly. Yeah. They had medicinal ales and beers. Like there's no problem at all. Probably the water was full of parasites. It was best that they <laughs> had all these herbals in their array and alcohol. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Back in the day, they were just drinking parasite water, eating food right out of the ground with the dirt still on it, drinking yeah, parasite and beer. and With the hoof marks and hoof poop all over it. <laughs> oh, my God. That makes me want to open a restaurant, like just called yeah. Back in the Day, and it's just food yeah. covered in dirt and drinking beer with parasites in it. And um, Well, cool. Well, Dr. Grace, this has been absolutely amazing. I have so many more questions for you, but I want to be respectful of your time. Um, this is awesome. I know you have a really cool site, the Gut Institute. I know you have uh, a lot of different interesting probiotics and products that you have. You, you help uh, coaches. Um, maybe talk a little bit about your, your services. Um, I'll put links to all that in my show notes and then we'll, we'll wrap things up. Yeah, absolutely. If you guys want more information, just go to thegutinstitute.com and there's a contact area there or you can catch me on Facebook Live. We have Facebook Lives every Tuesday at two o'clock. Yeah, I try to answer any questions or have some really cool topics I go over there. I love being on here, Eric. You're so full of awesome, awesome information. Love uh, hacking all things gut or brain, mind, access. It's all cool. So super cool. And you're so funny as fuck. Uh, we're having a good time. Um, <laughs> this is cool. Uh, before I, before you uh, sign off, any last words you'd like to leave, uh, leave the listeners or the viewers with? Uh, I just came from a meditation retreat. Um, and um, I learned something new. You know, when we are in a heart zone or mind zone that's only joy, we have our, our best lives. You know, we're literally, um, the saying from Brazil, um, the medicine tribes there is that we are untouchable when we are in a zone of only joy. So I will leave it with that. Um, that's what I'm like holding into my heart. And yeah, I hope that some people might like that. And joy, very good parasympathetic stimulator. Yes, exactly. Follow Dr. Grace at the Gut Institute. We'll put all your Facebook links and Twitter and everything awesome. in the show notes. And thank you for watching and listening to the Holistic Nootropics podcast. For more, check out holisticnootropics.com forward slash podcast. And we'll catch you on the next one. Thanks for listening. For more brain boosting info, in-depth articles, and show notes, check out holisticnootropics.com.